All right, as we go, as of now, everything is being recorded in live on YouTube. So as we are talking, just make sure we don't say anything funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a lot of people already. Eight. Dr. Dang is not yet here. Okay, so Chaturika, you want to start saying something about it? Not not presenting your work, but <laughs> <laughs> just, just talking um, to us about this stuff. As I, I know you're going to defend your thesis soon. <laughs> yeah, mm. it will probably be the same thing that I'll be doing today also. So we will not going to be doing anything for the next two weeks. <laughs> it will be the same thing that I'll be presenting today. And these are on machine learning which is kind of a combination of math stat and computer science so we are still new to this field but we tried our best to use the knowledge we have in math and statistics to solve the problems in a more theoretical way that they have in terms of uh, their practical applications okay um, so we should tell our viewers and listeners that this is your thesis project that you have done and uh, you're talking to us today in preparation for your defense that is <laughs> happen very soon yes <laughs> yeah and your advisor is dr sang mm -hmm. so this is what basically dr sang and i did for the last couple of years okay. and we had mm -hmm. so many ups and downs and now we are kind of at like the finish something point. <laughs> yeah, finish line now. That's great. So uh we have nine people and we are so we're waiting for 12. So I think maybe we should just start and others mm -hmm. as time goes. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours, Chaturiga. Thank you, Dr. Langla. So um, I'm happy to see you all here. So I'm ready to present what Dr. Sang and I did for the last couple of years. And this is on a specific problem in machine learning. So we call this the double descent behavior. And we worked on a two-layer neural network for binary classification. So let me show you my um, outline. So first, I'm going to introduce you to the concept. And then we will move to the theorem number one, we will call as this as a generalization theorem. And then we move to theorem two, where we work on the empirical risk minimization procedure. And then at final phase, I will show you the illustrations that we have from theorem one and theorem two to make more sense about what we did, right? So moving into the preliminaries. So this is the classical bias variance trade-off curve that you have seen before in the last decades and decades of time. What happens is when you keep increasing the capacity of your model, the training risk is going to decrease uh, monotonically and it reaches zero at some place. And what happens to the test risk is it's going to decrease first and then it's going to increase again. So this is the case of having bias and variance trade of scenario. So we always call at that uh, time, the larger models are worse because when the model is having a higher capacity, we see the test risk is much higher, which is not favorable. What we want is a lower test risk. So that's why we always go with the larger models are worse concept in the previous cases. But surprisingly, like in 2000. 20, uh, 2019, people observed a different case of this uh, bias various trade of scenario where the training risk is kind of decreasing as usual. And after the classical U shaped curve, they observed the test arrays again decreasing, which is really nice because 
If you find a model in this uh, second design, it's going to have a comparatively lower test error when compared to the this U-shaped region. We call this uh, U-shaped area as the classical regime because it is the classical U-shaped curve. And this is the modern interpolating regime where we observe the overparameterized model in our case, right? So this is the double descent concept, and we call it double descent because we see two descents coming up. And then uh, this idea is working on uh, most of the machine learning models. So we were inspired by that, and we looked at what other people had done about this, and we noticed most of these uh, results are experimental or like uh, they work on data set and they work on that one and show this double descent is going to be there as empirically. Like for most of the machine learning techniques like neural network, residual neural networks and convolutional neural networks. But the theories of them are a little bit far behind because no one is working on them to handle the theoretical side. And then another thing we noticed that uh, in terms of the test error function, we can express the test error function uh, as a function of different variables that are in our model. So depending on that, people observe different cases of double descent as model-wise, where you keep increasing the model size of the test error, uh, model size of the model, and then the sample-wise double descent. At that place, you are going to increase the number of samples, and you still observe the double descent behavior. And then the epoch-wise is you keep increasing the training type, then still you can see the double descent, and also sometimes depending on the ratio, of different parameters in the model, like the number of training samples, the dimension, like that. So we found few interesting theoretical work, uh, like by Dr. Deng and Dr. Kinney. They worked on a binary linear classification model, and they showed the test error is going to behave as a double descent uh, way uh, for logistic loss and square loss respectively, and a sample wise was done by uh, Nakiran and he analyzed everything analytically and proved when you keep increasing the number of sample, you can still see the two descents in the model. So we were inspired by this one and we worked on a two layer neural network with the ReLU activation function and, and we wanted to do the binary classification. So by introducing a ReLU activation function, we tried to make a our linear model a little bit piecewise linear because when you look at the ReLU activation function, it is defined as maximum of zero or uh, C. That means if you have negatives, you are going to get zeros. If you have positive values, you are going to get the same exact positive value. So it's like a piecewise function. You have two pieces. So that's another step we had kept inside. And then um, we wanted to develop the tester as a function of the ratio. We call the ratio as alpha, where we define alpha to be n by d. n is the number of training samples, and d is the dimension of the model. So that when alpha is less than 1, that means when n is less than d, that is going to define the overparameterized region of our model. And when alpha is greater than 1, that means d is less than n, it will define our underparameterized model region in our model. So that means when we are increasing alpha in our x-axis, first we go through the overparameterized region, and then we move to the underparameterized region. And we notice when alpha equals to one, that's the place where we have n and d are equal, it will uh, separate the two regions in our test model. So we wanted to see how the asymptotic behavior of the test error when n and d goes to infinity. So we worked on uh, that case also. So this is our problem. Um, here is going to be my student model. I define it to be the ReLU neural network with two layers. I start with the training set of n data points where I denote it by d, and xi's are going to be my feature vectors, and it's from d-dimensional vector. Yi, this is a binary classification model, so they are going to be one and positive, negative, negative one. So I have two classes. So starting from the input layer, that brings my initial xi's to the model, and xi is the feature vector, as I said before. And since I have n data points, I can have my feature matrix, which is going to be d by n size. And then from the input layer, I'm moving to the middle layer, which is going to be my hidden layer. So it's going to have one neuron and it will calculate the ReLU value of XA transpose beta over root D plus B. So here 
beta is my weight vector, which is d-dimensional one, and b is the bias term, sigma is my ReLU function. So it will calculate the ReLU value. So depending on the output of my hidden layer, the output layer will calculate whether the output is going, output is going to be one or negative one using this classification rule. So if the ReLU output is positive, I'm going to go with the label number one. If the ReLU output is zero or negative, that's going to give me negative one. Usually the ReLU output is always zero for negative values. We don't get any negative values to compare. It's always zero, but then it's going to give us negative one plus. So this is the student. So I have to teach this student how to work. So that's why I have my teacher model. Teacher model is going to generate all the XI values and related to YI values. So if you look at this one, XI is generated through this format. EDAS and epsilon i's are Gaussian vectors and each of them are going to have components from a standard normal distribution. And YI is my class label. Depending on each class label, I'm going to have a respective XI value. And I also control how the class labels are going to be because I'm going to keep um, uh, for the labels having number uh, having one, they are going to go with the probability row one. And if the class label is negative one, they are going to have a probability of row negative one like that. And then with all these, I can always show that XI is going to be a Gaussian vector with mean zero. So this is the teacher model or else how we're going to generate our data. Right. Um, um, since I want to observe the higher dimensional setting in the test error when in ND goes to infinity, I work with the ratio format where alpha is going to be my ratio and in by D is going to be defined like that. I keep few quantities, exactly two things as fixed quantities where R is going to be the two norm squared of beta and I divide it by D and S is going to be beta transpose eta over D. So these two are positive or zero values. They are not going to be negatives. And I want my beta i's to be bounded for all i. And having these two fixed quantities, I can always show my s squared is less than or equal to r by koji schwartz inequality. So throughout my model, these two are fixed and they will be go by s squared is always less than or equal to r. So let's move to the generalization part. Here I'm going to talk about the test error or the generalization error of my model. And how we do that is by giving my model a previously unseen data set, sorry, a data pair. So it's going to work uh, as designed. So it's going to use uh, the weights from my training. That's here I'm going to use my beta hats. They are coming from uh, the training part where I use my original training data and calculate beta hat, and I'll be using those to make the decision on the new data pair. And also when it comes to selecting the predicted value, I'll be using the classification rule we introduced in the output layer. So theorem one says, I'm sorry, yeah. Theorem one says uh, the test error can be found using this formula. So here I have one minus rho one times phi of S plus B over root R minus rho one minus phi of S minus B over root R. So S is S and R are my fixed quantities. B is the bias. Row one and row negative one are going to be the probabilities associated with labels one and negative one. Phi is going to be the CDF of the standard normal variable. So this is the exact test error my model is going to make. So let me show how I prove this is going to be true. So we start with uh, calculating the test error from the definition. For a binary classification model, we define the test error to be the expectation of a misclassification rate. So that's why I have the expectation of the indicator function where the event is going to be f hat of xn is not equals to yn, so that we are going to have a misclassification. So expectation of an indicator function is the probability value of that particular event. So I have the same second equal line here. And then f hat of xn is my output from the two-layer neural network. So that is going to be the sine function of the ReLU function. So sine of the ReLU output. So that's why I have sine of the ReLU is not equals to ym. And in the next line, I notice sine is going to be one or negative one. 
and yn is going to be one or negative one. If they're going to be a mismatch, that means sine is one, yn is negative one, or sine is negative one, yn is one, like that. So that means the product is going to be always negative. And if the product of the sine function and yn is negative, that means the sign of the product of yn and the ReLU is going to be negative. That's why I have the line before the last line. Um, so the last line is as a result when you compare the product of these two things, because uh, sine of something negative is going to be less than zero. That means what's inside the sine function should be negative or equal to zero. Uh, so that's how I have my last line. So then I noticed that sigma or the ReLU output is always zero or something positive so that I can get rid of the ReLU function and just put what's inside the ReLU and write yn times what's inside the ReLU as negative because it's ne zero or positive. So with the product of yn, I get the product to be um, negative or equals to zero. Um, in the next line, third line, I just simplify it to make it a little bit nicer. And you see, I have xn here, which is the x value that I have in my new data pair. And that is also related to the how I generate my data. So I replace this xn by my teacher model. So I replace it by eta, eta yn root d and epsilon n. And a little bit of simplification, it will get me to the last line where I substitute my um, fixed values where possible and keep it like this way. So I notice I have two yn's in two terms. yn can be one or negative one. So in the next line, I'm trying to get it into two cases like when yn equals to one and when yn is equal to negative one. The good thing is I know the probability of getting yn equals to one and probability of getting yn equals to negative one. So these are predefined values. So I use the conditional probability on these yns and simplify further and using the cumulative distribution function of the Gaussian or the standard normal variables, I can simplify the last two lines as this. So this is the exact error that my model can make. The problem is how to find these S, B, and R values. And another thing is I want to observe the high dimensional behavior of my test error. So observing that means I want to find what are the high uh, values that are achieved by R, S, and B when N and D goes to infinity. So I'm going to fix R star, S star, and B star be the values achieved by R, S, and B when N and D goes to infinity. So if I want to observe the asymptotics of the test error, I'm going to plug these R star, S star, and B star in my test error formula. I can see what's going to happen. So still, the question is, how to find this R, S, and B value. So these things are related to the training part of the model. So I'll be looking at what is going to happen in the empirical risk minimization procedure so that I can find R, S, and B values. Right, so here I define my empirical loss of the risk. Um, first thing I'm going to define is my classification performance of the neural network. It is R, N hat of beta. This depends on the sample set that training set that I have, and I have n number of training samples. So I'm going to consider the loss function. It is going to be a margin-based convex loss function. Since this is for binary classification, I consider the product of y times the output of my model. So that's why I have here the product, and this L is going to be a margin-based convex loss function. Uh, to make a more perfect model, I'm going to add a tuning parameter lambda along with the L2 regularization term. So that's all about the classification performance. So uh, L can be any margin-based convex loss function. I would say square loss, logistics loss, exponential, hinge. These are going to work for this case. I am going to keep L as it is and work on separate cases when I really need to work on a specific loss function. Right, so usual way that how we do the empirical loss minimization is by, um, we solve this optimization problem, like we solve this minimization problem using a gradient descent method or um, any iterative based algorithm method, right? So, but the problem with ReLU activation function is it's non-differentiable at zero. You cannot find its derivative at zero. And also ReLU has the problem called dying ReLU, 
that's when when you have more negative inputs your ReLU output will be always zero so you don't know what's going on so more negatives zero outputs you don't know what's going on so it's what we call as dying ReLU basically ReLU has done nothing only going to give you zeros so these problems can be handled when you are working in an empirical way uh, because you have more data, but you have some substitutions to get through these issues like using um, uh, alternate, uh, sorry, using an absolute ReLU function or a leaky ReLU function like that. But in our case, we wanted to go in a theoretical way. So we thought of doing, not doing a training algorithm on this minimization procedure. So instead we looked at a special theorem called convex quotient minimax theorem, which allowed us to find a theoretical candidate for this local minimum of the training risk. Um, I'll show you what is this convex quotient minimax theorem later. Um, so here I'm going to introduce you two of the techniques we used. First thing is the legendary transformation. Hopefully you have heard or seen this before, where you are working with the convex function. And you also have a convex conjugate function. Using the conjugate function, you can define the legendary transformation of the previous convex function using this first formula. And if you want to find the convex conjugate, you can use the second one. Basically in the first one you see, you can replace the convex function with a problem of maximization. So it's like making the life a little bit harder using this transformation, but uh, that's going to work later. Let's see. And here is the convex quotient minimax theorem, very coincise version because this is a long theorem and it's going to have several sections. I just point out things that we used. Uh, the idea is when you're going to have a optimization problem, it can be a maximization one, it can be a minimization one, uh, but if you can break down your problem into this primary optimization problem and the auxiliary optimization problem as defined here, then you can compare the probabilities of these two using the convex quotient minimax theorem. So idea is first decompose your problem into the PO and the AO. And then if you have these uh, requirements satisfied by your system, you can compare the probabilities like always when the PO probability is less than the twice the probability of the AO like that. So we use these two techniques to solve the empirical risk in our problem. So I'm going to introduce you to the local training loss, which is defined using the classification performance in the model. We basically try to minimize the beta values or the weights that we have in our classification performance. This is what you see before as the empirical risk of the model. So we are going to minimize it subject to the two constraints, which are our fixed values, R and S. And the global training loss is going to be the minimum of the local one. And the global is not supposed to have any constraints, but as the way we define our R and S values, we have S squared is less than or equal to R throughout our model. So it's going to be here, right? So we are going to start with minimizing this local training loss subject to these two constraints. Okay, so here is what I showed you before, the local loss. And in the next line, I'm going to replace my sigma or the ReLU function with this format because keeping ReLU like this, I cannot simplify further. So I'm going to write it as the same thing plus the absolute value of that one over two format. So it will allow me to do some simplifications. And then what I see is I have the loss function of something here. This loss function is convex. So I'm going to write this loss function in terms of the legendary transformation of that particular loss function. So that's why I have maximus, maximum of UIs. UI is the variable that is related to my legendary transformation. It's a new variable. UI can be any real number. So I have this line by substituting L by its legendary transformation like before, so I showed you before. So here this L tilde is the convex conjugate of my loss function and that's it. Now you see I have a minimum minimization on beta and a maximization on UIs. So I'm simply trying to make 
my original optimization minimization problem into a min max form that I showed you here. So this is the way that I'm trying to reach. So you see a min max and I'm trying to reach that one. So I'm going to copy the same line from the last slide here as the first line. And in the second line, I'm going to notice one thing. That is the product of u, i, y, i. So I have a minimization on a beta term. When I look at the beta terms, I have a term with absolute value. So when this u, i, y, i, and it get multiplied with this absolute value, this minimization problem on beta is going to have a solution only when q, i, y's are going to be positive because you know the absolute value is always positive and then um, if the UIYI product is negative, we cannot talk about a minimization on that one. So we are going to restrict the product UIYI to be positive like this way. And then in the next line, I'm going to notice two things. First thing is when can UIYI equals to zero? YI is not going to be zero. It's one or negative one. So only case is you can have UI to be zero. What happens when UI equals to zero? Let's see, when ui equals to zero, the first whole thing is going to be zero. And when ui equals to zero, L tilde ui is going to be zero for convex margin-based loss functions. And then we are going to remain only with this lambda r over two term. We are going to get rid of all these optimization parts when ui equals to zero. So that's not going to make sense when it comes to this solving our primary optimization problem. So we want to get rid of the case where ui yi equals to zero. And that's why I get rid of that equal sign here. And another thing is, the second thing is, I notice this maximization is on each ui. So I can take it out from the summation because we are treating ui separately. And so that's why, that's how I reach my second line. And in the second line, I also substitute xi by my teacher model. I can use it anywhere I want because I'm training my student model. I can get the help from my teacher. So I'm going to replace these xi's from the teacher model and write it over here. And then simplifications in the next slide. And I'm going to consider the first, second, and the term, third terms as psi beta ui. And I will keep the last term as it is. And also I notice this yi is one or negative one. Epsilon i is going to be a d-dimensional vector with Gaussian components, standard normal components. So I'm going to use a new variable as this way and write it like this one. So here my psi is going to be denoted by the first three terms that I have in this line. Okay, so this will take me to the place if the last line will show my the primary optimization problem where I have a min and max, so I can have my uh, way to the convex quotient min max theorem. So this is the primary optimization problem. After reaching this, I have to decompose this into the auxiliary optimization problem, and this is that. So I'm going to start with uh, the new variable u. This is from n-dimensional one, all the reals, and G and H are going to be two new Gaussian vectors in Rn and Rd. So the respective auxiliary optimization problem, I am going to denote it by L tilde, and it is defined like this way. We still have the minimization, we still have the maximization U and the constraint, and the psi function is going to stay as it is. Only thing we are going to do is we will decompose the last term of my primary optimization into two terms like this. So beta to norm and then u to norm and this is how it's going to work. And only thing we know is g and h are two Gaussian vectors, right? So now I'm going to do one more thing. That is when this psi function is convex concave, I can interchange the, I can change this, the order of min and max. Noticing my psi function is convex concave, I'm going to change their order so that I can work with the minimization first and then work with the maximization. Looking at the minimization of beta, I see I have to minimize the beta terms in here, and I have another minimization of beta term in here. So 
taking those two together, I will first work on the minimization and then look at the maximization later, right? So since I take this minimization inside the sum inside the summation, that's why I have this greater than or equal sign here. That means I have to work with two minimization terms on beta separately. Looking at the first one, I don't see I can solve it exactly, but I'm going to find a lower bound for that one like this way. Um, and then for the last term, which is over here, this is an absolute value. UIYs are going to be positive. So the minimum value that this can have in terms of beta is going to be zero. So using those two results, I'm going to rewrite my auxiliary optimization problem a, a tilde like this way. The, it's going to be LD is greater than. So this is kind of a lower bound for my auxiliary optimization problem. Um, I'm going to call this lower bound as omega lambda d. And omega lambda d in there, I have another maximization problem in terms of u and with the constraint ui, yi greater than zero. That maximization problem is easy. We can handle this by using the Lagrangian dual format of the optimization. So I use that one. And if I say ui star with optimal ui value, that going to give me the maximum. So the solution of the UIs can be found using these relationships. It's not going to be an exact one. You see UIs here and there, and this will give us the solution. So once I substitute this UI in my problem, I can find omega lambda d to be this uh, simplified version, which looks good. So now what we have is, um, we found the primary optimization problem, we found the auxiliary optimization problem, and for the auxiliary optimization, what I have is a lower bound like this. So then I use a change of variables thing. I'm going to use a substitution as vi, going to be L tilde prime vi, ui star, and using the legendary transformation properties because this L tilde is the convex conjugate function. So I can have these two properties true. And I will substitute these values where necessary in uh, previous relationships I showed you. And it will give me these two results. And here I define gamma to be the whole thing. And the only thing that I should uh, make more significant thing is going to be my omega lambda d term. So if you look at this omega lambda d, I'm going to substitute my new variable over here and it will give me this nice version of my omega lambda d with the new substitution. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with this convex quotient min max theorem. So far, what I have is PO, AO problem, and the lower bound on AO problem. So using the first statement of the CGMT, I can compare the probability values of PO and AO. So that is what I have here. Probability of PO is twice less, uh, greater than the probability of uh, AO getting it less than C, and C can be any real value. And since AO has its lower bound, I have this probability comparison in between those two things. Combining these two, I can show that the probability of my primary optimization getting less than C, less, less than some constant, is going to be less than twice the probability of omega being less than C. And if I pick um, any positive delta, then I can show uh, that probability of having my primary optimization greater than the lower bound minus delta is going to be equals to one. So I'm sorry. So then I'm going to recall that L lambda star, which is going to be my global loss, and depending on the other side of my this probability equation, I'm going to minimize this side and call it omega lambda star so that I still have this relationship because in all the time, uh, local loss is greater than my lower bound of my uh, auxiliary optimization problem. So I have this relationship still when I consider the mean minimum or the minimization, I still have the same uh, side of the relationship. So 
the other side of this probability equation also can be shown through. So with that, I can show that the probability of getting uh, a lambda star equals to omega lambda star plus delta is always going to be one, which means in higher dimension, when I want to observe what is going to happen in my global loss, I can use the infimum of my candidate function, which is going to be omega lambda. They are going to have the same behaviors only in higher dimension. So that's the point of having a uh, convex quotient with Max theorem. Simply what we did was instead of observing what is happening with the global loss, which we can't deal directly, we found a candidate which we call as omega lambda d and showed that in higher dimension, my global loss and this candidate function, they are going to behave in the same way. So I can work on this uh, candidate function other than working on this global loss function. Right, so what are we going to do next is this whole thing is going with finding R, S and B values to be plugged into my test error formula, right? So if I can, if, by now we have omega lambda D, that's the candidate function. So I'm going to minimize that one and find omega lambda star. And depending on that, I'm going to find the R, S and B values. So first thing is minimizing omega lambda. So minimizing that one to find R, S and, R, S and B values is simply differentiating them with respect to R, S and B separately making them equal to zero and get the relationship and solve it, right? So this R1, R2, and R3 are the relationships that I get when I minimize omega lambda uh, function. And if I solve these three together, I can find R, S, and B. But the thing is, I don't want R, S, and B. What I want is what are the values achieved by R, S, and B in higher dimension when N and D goes to infinity? Instead of solving these three now, I'm going to observe the high dimensional behavior of these three equations and then solve for R, S, and B. So that work is represented here as this is what I told you now um, in my theorem two, where I solve those three equal, equal, uh, relationships and I consider the taking the limits when N and D goes to infinity and it will give me these uh, four, equations and these are valid for any convex loss function. I mean, like they are generalized for any convex loss function. If you, if you can pick one convex loss function and then you can work out this theorem like that. So this looks a little bit weird, but when you're having with, when you're going with one specific loss function, simplifying these is kind of very easy. So I'm going to take you to the application on a square loss part where I'm going to use a square loss function in both theorem one and theorem two to show you my results. So considering the current max loss, uh, square loss function, which is going to be half of vi minus one squared, um, I can find um, L prime of vi, which is vi minus one. And using the relationships that I have in theorem two, I can find R star, S star, B star, and gamma star is like a, a combining variable that I have in between these R, S, and B values. So I have that value also. Mm -hmm. So these four values can be used to uh, in theorem one to plot and see how the test error is going to behave, right? So I will be plugging these R, B, and S values in my test error formula, and it will give me this results uh, for a case where rho one equals to 0.5 and my regularization is going to be uh, very low, like 10 to the power negative five. So what happens here? This is the double listen I observed and X axis is alpha. So I'm increasing alpha. I'm increasing the ratio in between N and D. What happens to the test array is it's going to decrease first increase again and decrease again. And this is the region where my alpha is less than one. Alpha less than one means N is less than D. And this is the overparameterized region because we have higher dimension when compared to the number of training samples we have. So we see, and then moving to the other part, 
after, and we see the peak appears around one. That means our flight goes to one, where the case that I have the training samples and the dimension is equals. So that's the place I have the highest error. And then uh, in the underparameterized region, which is the region where n is greater than d, I see the tester is going through the, his second descent and it's reaching a very small value when compared to the test error that can happen in the overparameterized region. So, so what's your sample size? Um, no sample size is selected. We just work on the alpha map. It is alpha, that is the ratio in between N and D, not a simulation, just- In what your simulation? Have. In your simulation, you should have sample generate. What's your sample size? We don't generate any samples, madam. So what we have here is we work on these uh, findings like R, S, and B values. We plot them for varying alpha here. <clears throat> this is a theoretical. Theoretical yeah. attempt. So okay. is this this not a simulation study? This uh, mm -hmm. the case, uh, you know, when N D go to infinity, for each R alpha, you have uh, you know one error, then you. Uh, have the plot mm. for overall different R's, uh, different R's. Yeah. Yeah. So you are theoretically showing that what is observed in practice is, is supposed to happen. Yes. And this is for a very low regularization. According to my theorem results, I cannot make lambda to be zero. Um, so that's why I'm putting very small lambda values here to see what's going on. and. In the next one, I see what happens with high regularization. You see in here, I'm increasing my regularization from a very small value to a very high value. So in that case, you can see what happens to this particular peak. It's going, getting very smooth and finally giving us that uh, monotonically decreasing curve with higher regularization. So we know that too much regularization is also bad, right? But this is, something surprising we noticed for when pro one equals to 0.5, you can keep lambda increasing lambda for any number like even like 100, like this high, still you are going to get the very low test error. Um, so that's why we were curious about what's going on with 0.5 case. That means you are having equal number of negative ones and equal number of positive ones case. So we worked on having different row one values like 0.7, you have 70% of your data set to be positive ones and 30% is going to be negative one only. In that case, when we were increasing our lambda, we noticed the peak of the curve is still getting reduced for higher lambda values. But when lambda is greater than one, the blue one, it's going to show us a different behavior, not the double descent curve. So the lambda values like five, 10 and 100, they are not going to do something very good. So the optimal regularization should be somewhere in between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1. So we basically didn't work on finding the best or the optimal regularization that should present in our model, but it should be somewhere in between one and 0 0.05 to give us a better performance in our model. Um, I have some idea about the best. Yeah. Test error, the optimal yeah. test test error. Yeah, so when I compare the test errors by these, they are like high values, which we really don't favorable values. But the test errors by others, even though they have smaller lambda values, are going to be much better. I, I mean, I mean the your model based on your model, you should have like the Bayesian error, <clears throat> because this is a classification. So yes. did you develop what is the Bayesian error so that your right now your test error already approaches that? Yes, maybe. So we didn't work on the Bayesian error for our model, actually. So that if we do that, we might be able to show that uh, over there we have the optimal um, regularization. And I think we can talk about about that through this plot also. Here, what I did was like, uh, I fixed my alpha value 
that means I fixed alpha to be four. That means my n by d is four where the sample size and the dimension are having the multiples of four kind of meaning. So in that case, when I keep increasing lambda only for 0.5, which is this um, purple line is decreasing and it's going to be keeping steady. But for the other probability values like 0 0.49, 4999, I'm trying to reach 0.5 in that case. I see the probabilities get, uh, test rate is going to get reduced and then going up again. That is because of too much regularization. The model is going to be simple and it's going to be underfit. So I'm having high test rates. For the other three cases also, after some particular value, it goes up and that defines that higher regularization is going to give us more error. Um, this is what I observed from our theoretical um, try, and we can work on future cases like modifying this current model by adding more neurons and making the model more complex. I mean, the student, student model, I can make it more complex by having more layers and more neurons like that. And also I can see what happens with different activation functions uh, other than ReLU. So that brings me to the end. This is a few of my reference papers. Mm, if you have any questions, you can ask. Could you go back a little bit to that, the preview graph? I think maybe, I, unless I'm, the previous graph. Yeah, unless I misunderstood her question, were, were you asking about a limiting value for, for this test error, Dr. Dan? Yeah, so if, 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 if it is this is a classification problem based on your assumption of your data is from the normal or two classes from normal, they, they should have the the what is the Bayesian error. That's it's that's, called the Bayesian optimal uh, optimal error. Yes. Yeah. So if your your model achieves that the that is the Bayesian risk we call that it is consistent uh, model uh, what consistent uh, uh, classification uh, problem mm -hmm. yes yeah, good point so maybe um uh you should work on uh, check uh, work on the bh optimal mm -hmm. for, for the Clarification and the check, uh, uh, you know, if it, if it can be rich, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it could be something to work on even after your defense, because probably yeah. you're not ending research after getting your PhD. <laughs> yeah, you can think yeah of not, that. Not, not for the dissertation, but yeah, but <laughs> later on, yeah. yes, sure, sure. All these and things. Are your, your next slides, it is about your. Uh, next, yeah. So for me, I think it is if your two class a little bit uh, unbalanced, not mm -hmm. equal point five, then your model have sensitive to that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. That's why I wanted to see getting closer to point five, and I did observe the same thing getting uh, point five from the right side. Also, I observed the same behavior. So. Mm -hmm. It's going to be like this way, and the maximum error they are going to make is exactly the same as their probability value. Even like here, if you see the blue one with 0.499, maximum error is going to make is going to be that particular probability value. So we noticed that one. That's, that's already closer to the random guess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's really very sensitive, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Even, yes, yes. even a little bit far from, the, <laughs> just a little bit from 0.5, you, you get. It depends yes. on 0. 0. 0. 0.01 and the error that jumps like 30%. Yes. <laughs> and, and the other thing you use, like the conjugate convex uh, to get. Because that is about the ReLU is not differentiable. You you um using the conjugate. Yes. So the idea of using 
the conjugate function here, the legendary transformation. So actually this one supports us to get into this convex Gaussian min max theorem uh, way, having minimization and a maximization prob to problem together. Um, I know that ReLU has some issues with the gradient and the drying ReLU problem, but uh, we were able to get rid of those things with, because we didn't do any algorithm-based or iterative-based uh, minimization procedure. We didn't do any gradient-based methods. So we, instead of doing them, we focused on how to get into this convex Gaussian min max theorem so that we can compare the probabilities and find a candidate for the um, lo global loss function because we cannot work exactly on the global loss function with those problems with ReLU. Uh, 